Our passage, decided upon in this very moment by the power of the Holy Spirit, is chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, and this is a story that should be familiar to, to many of you. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all of these things that had happened while they were talking and discuss, discussing Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you're walking? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God. And all the people, how our chief priests and the leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So we went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they were told what had happened on the road. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had, made, had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of God for the people of God, and the people of God said, thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I pivoted on our passage for this morning because uh, we're still in that Easter season. Easter is another thing kind of like Christmas where we like all right, we celebrated the holiday, and let's move on to the next thing. But as followers of Jesus, we recognize that Easter uh, doesn't end on the Sunday of Easter, that we as people of God are resurrection people every single Sunday. And so this was a story I used in the first service, and it's the story that I want to help center us in as we talk about communion. We're doing a two-part series today and next Sunday on the sacraments. So the sacraments in the United Methodist Church, the only sacraments that we believe were instituted by Jesus and meant to be set apart as special conduits of God's grace are baptism and on the other side of our altar, communion. When I had a chance to kind of dream about what I wanted that space to look like, I said, why not put the sacraments at the center of what we do? And that's ultimately what this conversation between this week and next week is going to be, is what is the place of the sacraments in our life of worship and our life of faith? And one of the most essential things for us to understand is that the sacraments stand at the center of our church. One of the pastors that I uh, love is out of New Life Church in Colorado Springs. He's actually the pastor of their downtown campus. His name is Glenn Packiam. He wrote a book called The Resilient Pastor, but he also he wrote a book called Blessed, Broken, and Given about how the table particularly in Lord's Supper or the Eucharist or communion should stand at the center of our church life. And the reason he wrote that and the reason that that book came to be is because his church, New Life Downtown, they practice communion every week. And when somebody asks him about that, and I'm not, I'm not saying like, hey, communion's available, but I'm saying we break it and we walk through the liturgy every single week. And somebody asks him the question, why do you make that so critical to your worship experience? 
And now I'm filling in some blanks for him, but when Glenn Packiam started working at New Life, the senior pastor there was a guy named Ted Haggard. Ted was like a giant in the megachurch Christian pastor world. And he had a tremendous fall from grace uh, and an absolute disaster of a moral failure. And Glenn said when he was in that time experiencing the worst that the church can be, but also the worst that people can fling at the church, he recognized that there is an incredible danger when we put the preacher or the worship leaders or the staff or the stuff at the center of who we are as a church. And he said, so in an absolute defiance of the celebrity pastor movement, he says the table and the bread and the wine should be at the center of who they are as a church. And I've always resonated with that. I've always connected to that. And I think there may be a time down the line where I start leading us to partake in communion on a full level with regularity, uh, maybe weekly. There's some uh, details. All the people that actually handle the details, which is not me, are just like, maybe wait on that because... We still struggle sometimes to get volunteers to help distribute and all those things. And if you'd like to do that, Kyle Owens, our new director of worship, he would love to get you connected uh, to the people that handle the details of that. But I want to talk about communion and baptism these next few weeks. If they really are central to who we are as a church, it's probably helpful for us to understand what they really mean for us. Sacrament, as I'd mentioned, instituted by Christ, something special and set apart that is an absolute means of grace to you and I. That was the core of John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist Church. It was the core of his understanding of the communion and baptism. He says, God somehow, through the power of the Spirit, in a mysterious way, transforms our life when we come to the table and then when we experience baptism. He had a far more robust theology of baptism, which we're going to talk about next week, but they left communion a little bit light in their understanding. They kept going back to this word mystery, that there's just something mysterious that takes place when we take part in the body and the blood of Jesus. But what they didn't believe is that it was simply just a remembrance they believed, and what we believe today is that when we come to partake in communion that we will do at the end of our service today, is that it's not simply just come together and remember something, but it's to come and truly experience the power of Jesus and the life and love of Jesus, and through that to be transformed into the image of Jesus. So what happens for us is just what happens in anything we do with regularity is things end up becoming something where we don't really think about what we're doing. How many of you, and, and I've used this imagery before, but how many of you have driven somewhere, regardless of how long or short the drive is, and then all of a sudden, 20, 30, five minutes into the drive thought, oh, I haven't been paying attention at all. But, yes, thank you, raise that hand. But you're, you're moving in a direction but because you've driven for so long, I'm 40 years old, as I mentioned, very close to the end of my life, and I've been driving now for 24 years. 24 years, a lot of miles put on cars, different cars. Now there are many times where I am just not even really paying attention, especially when you get on the highway, which some of you are like, Jay, you need to lock it up, buddy. This is not what you need to be telling people. So let me give you another example. Maybe for you, it's, it's the, the things you do routinely. Uh, for me, this is too much information, but welcome to Canon Sunday. So every morning I take a shower, every single morning. I get up and take a shower, and there are times where I go through the motions so much that there will be a point where I finish and I'm like, did I, did I wash my face? Did I shampoo my hair? Do you get what I'm saying? Because we do the, thank you, we do these things with so much regularity, yeah, we do these things with so much regularity that they become something that we just mindlessly move through. And I think that actually can also happen with these worship experiences. And this is from the top to the bottom. Because I think sometimes we come in this room and we're just going through the motions, you know? And often that motion in this church is 
Don't sing and keep your hands down, right? But what I believe that God wants to do in this moment as we focus in on the sacraments, specifically around the sacraments, is to recognize that these are not ever intended to be something that we simply go through the motions with. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians, and he talks about to the church in Corinth, he says, he says I'm not going to commend you on the way that you partake in the Lord's Supper, because when you come together, you actually use it as an opportunity to divide. He says that those who have a lot, those who are well fed, come together and they eat the Lord's Supper and they get drunk, and those who don't have anything get there and they don't have anything to take in or to partake in. He says that's not That's not how this was intended to be because the Lord's Supper is ultimately an incredibly powerful equalizing opportunity. Is that at the bread and the, I keep saying wine, we don't have wine in these cups, just a heads up. But when we come to the table, all of us equally are invited, are unworthy, and are made worthy by the blood of Jesus Christ. So it equalizes all of us. No matter your status, success, or failures, all are invited, all are guilty, and all can be redeemed by Jesus. So what do we believe about communion? I'm gonna be brief on this because I want to really land with how communion shapes our life as the church. So we believe that is an outward sign of an inward grace. This is an Augustinian. So St. Augustine, he kind of coined this phrase, 1600 years ago when it's still the phrase we go back to so we believe that there's an outward sign of an inward grace we have two of them as i mentioned sacraments we have communion we have baptism so confirmation like catholics not a sacrament here marriage not a sacrament here giving alms not a sacrament we have how many two sacraments okay so whenever you get the pop quiz later on methodist theology you'll know But what I love about communion in particular, but really both the sacraments, is that there's nothing special about what we use to celebrate the sacraments. Sometimes, sometimes, it's special in the fact that we get the sweet Hawaiian roll. (laughs) As my son used to call it, candy bread. Sometimes we do get the special bread, but more than not, because you can't find those loaves anymore. These are just loaves of bread bought from Uptown Grocery and juice that was made by whoever makes the off-brand at Walmart. (laughs) Nothing special about them. Yet, when we pray here in a minute and we impart the power of the Holy Spirit over these elements by the presence of the Spirit, they become sacred, set apart, holy, something more than just bread and juice. It's the same thing with water. So when we have, every week we have baptism water that's in here that you can always remember your baptism of making the sign of a cross on your forehead. And I've I've really tried to shift my perspective to where, hey, this, this water just came out of the tap. Now, sometimes we have baptismal water and 10 years ago, AC had water he brought back from the Jordan River, and he would pour it into that. And I, eventually it was one of those things where I was like, are we going to end up like making somebody incredibly ill, like 20 year old Jordan water? It's like, Jesus, you need to act in a miraculous way to make this not deadly. So this just comes from, I have a sink back here in this little side office, and it just came from the sink. But what happens is when I'm pouring it into this bowl, I begin to pray, God, this is just water, yet by your spirit, you can make it an agent of transformation, that by touching it and remembering, and then I pray, Lord, somebody today needs to be baptized, and let this be the water that marks their life new today. And then we pray here in a minute. God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and on this gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us your body and your blood. And something changes. So there's two things that are important with that. Number one, as I started to make this revolution in my own life in the aisle at Walmart, which is not one of my favorite places in the world, nor something I would ever call sacred, but I was walking through the aisle at Walmart and I 
I was getting bread and juice for something. I can't even remember what we were doing communion for. And I just thought, how incredible that God takes ordinary things and makes them sacred. Because the important thing that I want to make sure you don't miss from today is that's your story and my story as well. It's that God looks at us in our relative ordinary nature. I know some of you think you're extraordinary and I affirm that you're special. Don't let anybody tell you differently, okay? But God can take you and I and by his grace and spirit turn us into something set apart which is really what holy means. Something sacred because we are the indwelling of God is in us. I don't know about you, that's encouraging. It should be encouraging. And the other thing I just want to make sure that we acknowledge is the fact that God is present in so many things. We have this tendency to kind of put things in these dueling natures, like there's the physical world and the physical world is evil and then the spiritual world and the spiritual world is good. But what we see in the person of Jesus, the incarnation is the ultimate example that the physical and the spiritual can be melded into this incredibly sacred, beautiful, grace-filled thing. So if you see God in nature, know that you are connecting to the heart of what makes communion and baptism so special. Nature is not a sacrament, though, okay? Just clarification. As I mentioned, that the Wesley brothers believed that there was just something mysterious that took place, but what they did define in their theology of communion, and what we affirm here, is that both of these sacraments are what we call means of grace. Now, what does that mean? Pun not intended. Means of grace means that that when you come to the table, you are offered an opportunity every single time to either experience the grace of God for the first time or to be transformed into the image of God through the grace of God. That that John Wesley said that Holy Communion is the grand channel of God's grace to us. And so one of the things that would happen in the early Methodist movement is they kind of were like this non-church specific movement where it was a bunch of Anglicans, and then they started getting different denominations, but they would meet on the side, and John said, you always have to go to church on Sunday, and the reason you have to go to church on Sunday is because that's where you can take Holy Communion, because Holy Communion is the way God shows his grace to you every single week. So it's a means of grace. One of the things that's important is here in a minute is you're going to have an opportunity to come and partake in Communion. And this is why we here at New Covenant continue to affirm that you don't have to be a part of this church. You don't have to even be a professing follower of Jesus. But if you come with an expectation to experience and know the grace of God, with a heart that is ready to know Jesus, then you are invited to the table. So, that's kind of a concluding, well, two-part concluding thing. I want to at least address how we are expected to come to the table. Uh, I don't know about you, but, but for me, is I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up in high church. That was not my thing. Communion was pretty low in our church's priority growing up. Uh, and then on top of that is we didn't have a whole lot of like real defined dinner table etiquette. Uh, my wife went to, what's it called, cotillion or something like that, and they did all these things where they taught you how to be a normal person, and we just ate hamburger helper with our hands, apparently. So... Uh, in some cultures eating with your hands is actually preferred okay so we were just advanced beyond you all so um but i never had that kind of etiquette and so you know being married to somebody that did have that etiquette there's always times we went to the metro wine bar and restaurant because we don't drink wine uh, only grape juice and so we went to metro and like they have so much silverware We've been married now for 11 years. We've been together for 15 years, and I still have to look at her setting, right? Like, all right, so what goes outward to inward? Fork, small fork, big fork, knife, spoon. I think that's roughly it. Or when we eat at home, like one of the things that we make sure we don't do is I always take my, I take my hat off. Regardless of how ridiculous I look, I take my hat off to eat. Now, that's because there's unwritten expectations or sometimes written expectations for the way that you should come to the table, 
Now, as I just mentioned, is Jesus invites all to the table. And so I don't want to raise some sort of bar to where you might feel that you aren't able to come because you don't know how to put your silverware the way it should be. But what I want you to know is that, that for those of you especially who profess Jesus Christ as Lord, there is an expectation for how you come to the table. And the first part of that expectation is introspection. To look inside your heart. Is there a sin that you need to kind of get right with God about? Is there a relationship that's fractured that you need to work to restore? Is there something going on in you that you need to prepare yourself to come to the table? It's examination, it's confession, it's humility. But in the end, what it never does is it never trumps the fact that we have an open table. The first thing we say in our liturgy is this, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live at peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin. And then we go to a time of confession because we believe what matters is that we take this opportunity to corporally confess the things that we may not know that even we did that are sinful. So we come with an open table. We come with a posture of examination and confession and humility. And then the last thing is that we come expecting to experience Jesus. This goes back to that kind of muscle memory thing. And if we look at the story that we read from the book of Luke, this is what's happening. On this road to Emmaus, you have these disciples that aren't like the 11 disciples, but they're other disciples, and they're carrying this heaviness. And Jesus is walking with them, and they're just walking. And do you not know what happened these last few days? Jesus of Nazareth was killed, but then we heard that he's resurrected. We don't know what's going on. And Jesus just begins to tell them his whole story. And the whole time, the whole time they're unaware of who it is that's talking to them. Because they're just going through the motions just walking, dealing with whatever it is. Uh, Catherine Cates, who's our communication director, sent me this article that kind of changed, shifted the paradigm of what I wanted to communicate today. And it's a guy named Scott Erickson. Scott Erickson does these incredible illustrations dealing with different themes throughout Scripture. And one of the things he said, he said that it's interesting that walking through the Scriptures made their hearts burn, but it was the participation in a meal that opened their eyes to see the risen one in their midst. Something happened when they broke the bread that snapped them out of going through the motions. When Jesus blessed it and broke it and gave it, they recognized he was in the room with them. I don't want to miss that opportunity today is that when we do this here in just a minute, when we break the bread and we bless it and then we give it, is that maybe when you've been walking through the motion in your faith journey, when it's that default mode where you kind of just don't even think about what happens on Sunday, which I'm just here, and maybe this time, and I love there's a song called 10,000 Charms maybe. Nope, I just combined two songs. But there's a guy named Robbie C. who says that maybe this time the bread and wine will be more than food on my lips. And that's the prayer for you today. Is that when you come to the table, when we break it, is that you might notice that Jesus has been with you. So in closing, which I've never said one time in a sermon, and then actually closed, um, what I want you to know is that beyond the fact that you get to come to the table is that there's an expectation for what you do once you've come to the table. And not just simply that you would take it with a prepared heart or an expectant heart, but just recognizing that at the center of the story of the sacraments is that we are changed for the sake of the world. When I bless these elements here in just a second, there's a thing called the epiclesis that I will pray over them. And those words are, Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And then it's this, it says, so that we might be for the world your body redeemed by your blood. Our identity is reformed by the Eucharist, by the Lord's Supper, by the table. And our mission is sent out, not lifting up our own glory or name, but by lifting up the bread and the wine. By saying, we bring the crucified and risen Jesus with us everywhere we go. 
as I'd mentioned before, Glenn Packiam is this pastor that really resonated with this, and he talked about the fact that the church must claim its identity in connection to communion by being a church who is blessed, broken, and given. Blessed, meaning somebody who experiences the favor of God, not because of anything they've done, but because of God's unbelievable, unconditional grace. They're blessed, they're broken in the sense that recognizing their frailty and need for God's transformation and given that they are poured out as an offering for the world around them. This is for you, yet it's not only for you. And what I believe deep in my heart is that there are people in your life, in your world, there are people on the streets right now at the dog park just down the, down the road driving from this to that, coming back from the Memorial Marathon, who need to know that God is in the business of taking that which is ordinary and making it sacred and holy. And that opportunity is for you here today, is that when we partake in communion as part of our service today, is you can be told that no matter what you've done, no matter what you will do, is that God's grace and love is for you. And then there are some of you in this room who know that, who come to the table prepared and ready and expectant, and what you need to hear today is that food is not just for you. That that food is through you an opportunity for others to know and experience the love of Jesus Christ. So however it is you come to the table, I encourage you to do so. by thinking.